Okay, hello everybody. You know, I'm, I'm, I was up in a tree as you can see. I'm about 20 feet off the ground. Uh, I'm in beautiful Oakland, California. You can see uh, it's a mixture of uh, uh, mixed uh, age residential settings. You got a, you know, you got your old uh, built in a uh, circa 1895 wood roof with some uh, older construction debris and garbage on a roof. And then you got over there the, uh, the token uh, gentrification style fencing and a, uh, and wall structure on a, on a newer building. Uh, you know, all the social issues aside currently going on in this, uh, uh, what you would call a gentrifying city, you know, where you have both the massive homeless camps as well as uh, the more yuppie uh, residential housing and people walking $1,200 purebred dogs around uh, looking, you know, smug and arrogant. Uh, that all aside, I do want to show you this tree. It's a really fantastic member of the... Uh, Formerly the, the chocolate family, it's the Culeaceae, but which has now been nested within the larger cotton and hibiscus family, Malevaceae. This is Caranthodendron pentadactylon. Now, pentadactylon just means five-fingered. And uh, looking at that the Androecium right there, the, those, uh, the male part of this flower, you can see why it's got that name. Looks like a little a demonic hand coming out of this beautiful a red corolla. Actually, it's not a corolla because it's not composed of petals. Like many members of the Sterculiaceae, the, this uh, this plant's flowers just produce sepals. There are no petals. So it's uh, actually a massive calyx with what you would call an androgynophore. Okay, that's a mixture of androecium and gynoecium, male and female parts, fused together into the same column. And a lot of members of Malvaceae uh, have such a structure. Now this plant is uh, obviously not native, to Oakland, but it's not invasive. I kind of do wish it was invasive because it's such a fucking stunner of a plant and it's a huge nectar source as you can look in there and see that liquid down at the bottom of those those cupped sepals. It's a huge nectar source for birds. I got a, a relative of this tree. It's a hybrid that's formed by this tree hybridizing with our native California flannel bush in my backyard and I see this fucking mockingbird sticking his head in there. Same thing that he's up every morning. He's just trying to bang making tons of noise, you know, screaming his head off, impersonating everything from scrub jays to towhees. And uh, he oh, frequently comes to the one in my backyard to feed. Now, the, the hybrid that this forms, Caranto Formancio lensii, is uh, the flowers are a little bit smaller, but it does have that same remarkable androgynophore structure. Now, the other important thing to notice here is that the, this plant uh, forms, like I said, an intergeneric hybrid with our native California flannel bush from Monodendron californicum. Now those, these two plants uh, don't grow anywhere near each other. They, uh, they in fact grow about 3,000 miles apart. This plant is native to southern Mexico, the states of Guerrero, Oaxaca, and Chiapas. And I've actually seen it in habitat before, but obviously, you know, during a pandemic and a, you know, with times being what they are, it's a little bit rough to get back down to Oaxaca, but I did see it. It was about, I don't know, two years ago. And I was out there with my friend Alan Rockefeller, and we were looking for Salasabi zapatacorum. Actually, he was. I was just looking for the plants, which is a hallucinogenic mushroom that comes up uh, in landslides. And the landslide thing is important to mention because where this plant grows, it's very steep, uh, mountainous terrain. It grows at an elevation of about 9,000 feet. I've seen it in the, near the town of San Jose del Pacifico in southern Oaxaca. Uh, it could be kind of a sketchy area at times. There's some, maybe some mild uh, cartel action. A friend of a friend was murdered there once uh, in a bar. She was, but that wasn't anything to do with the cartel. It was just a creep. Okay, rest in peace. Bless her soul. And that aside, uh, it's it also grows down into Guatemala. The, the terrain where this grows are amazing cloud forests. Uh, also saw a rare plant called Passiflora oaxacensis down there. I guess I was the uh, first one to uh, photograph it in uh, well over 20 years. Uh, and uh, it's just, you know, uh, amazing, amazing area. There's also Pinguicula, the carnivorous uh, plant that uh, grows down there. I uh, forget what species it was. I'd have to look uh, at the, the notes I took when I was down there. But amazing habitat, very steep, very sketchy terrain. And uh, this thing just grows on the slopes, you know, uh, gets upwards to 80, 90 feet tall. Now, if you want to see this plant, uh, in, uh, if you want to see this plant, uh, you know, in California, which is, I think, the only region it might be able to grow in, because it's not very frost tolerant. But if you want to see it, you know, a number of botanic gardens got it. San Francisco Botanic Garden has it. Uh, Berkeley Botanic Garden has it. Uh, here's the fruits right there. And it does, it grows amazingly fast. This tree that I'm actually 
standing in right now, I planted about the, I don't know, six or seven years ago, and it was maybe the, maybe the, maybe about you know, inch or two diameter. But you could see now these leaves too are something remarkable. You could see like many members of uh, the Malvaceae are covered in what you would call the stellate hairs, which just means kind of star-shaped hairs, and it's on the abaxial surface. The top surface is a. Uh, Got a, got a couple hairs on them, but uh, but it's relatively glabrous. But look, really, look at that, look at that leaf texture. Look at those prominent veins. I mean, this is this is just the remarkable fucking plant, and the fact it does so well here, it grows so fast. As long as you give it full sun, uh, makes it uh, really easy for horticulture. I'm surprised they don't grow it more. Other interesting thing about this plant is that it's self-fertile. So one, all you need is one tree to produce fertile seeds. I'll, uh, I'll show you what it looks like over here. Okay, now there's one of the fruits. As you can see, the fruit is a five-lobed capsule, and each uh, fruit has about, I don't know, 50 or 60 seeds inside. You can see the seeds right there. Now, you might notice those seeds have a little uh, piece of tissue attached to them. That uh, It's kind of like an orangish-yellow thing, uh, but the seed itself is that black, smooth, uh, little bead. Now that thing that's attached to it, that little uh, orange or yellow piece of tissue, is what you would call an eliosome. And eliosomes are normally used uh, by plants, well used by plants. The, the benefit they confer to plants is that the ants will go there and will, will, will take the seeds and bring them back to the nest strictly just to get that eliosome to eat it and, uh, and then they will discard the seed in a refuse pile near the nest and then of course by doing so they're dispersing the seed and then inducing it to germinate. But uh, these eliosomes are made mostly for birds, just like the flowers. These massive flowers are pollinated mostly by birds and bats. The seeds are also mostly dispersed by birds. So a bird will go there, he'll see that little tissue, he'll grab that tissue, uh, that, that whole seed, and uh, digest the eliosome and then shit out the seed. And in doing so, scarifying the seed, giving the seed the scarification that it needs it to uh, uh, crack that seed coat and then uh, let water inside and at which point that will germinate. Now a way you could do this if you're a human being is uh, well, hey, there's everything. People recommend different things. You could take a couple seeds, throw them in your mouth, lightly chew them, not too hard, but lightly chew them and then soak them for a few hours. You could also do that with juniper seeds or you could just take them and uh, heat up some water in an electric kettle, you know, and uh, put these in a little pint glass and uh, pour, the, uh, pour the hot water over them, you know, and uh, that hot water will be enough. It's just called a hot water treatment. You can do it with a lot of seeds. You know, it's what you do with Formonodendron seeds, the species that uh, this this tree hybridizes with to produce that intergeneric hybrid Caranto formacia. Uh, you, you give the formacia seeds, the Formonodendron seeds, a hot water treatment as well. I've germinated both of these before. Uh, I gave these a hot water treatment, and then I basically just forgot about them. And uh, you know, it took a few months for the seeds to germinate. But uh, if you give it, if I, if you give it a good hot water treatment, you soak them in a glass, and then you, you know, if it works, you know, I'd suggest you take a bunch of them. You soak them in a glass, and then uh, you know, you could tell if they, uh, if it worked or not, because the ones that the seed coat cracked and uh, are, you know, it's already starting. They're starting to uh, that the embryo inside is already getting getting gone you'll be able to tell because the seed will swell a little bit. And I actually just did that a day or two ago, so I should be germinating a few of these right now. But again, you see those little uh, eliosomes that induces it, they, that uh, it motivates the birds to eat those little seeds. They eat the seeds, digest the tissue, and then shit out the seeds somewhere else in a cloud force, and that seed lays in wait uh, until it gets uh, enough moisture, and then it germinates, and boom, you get a new tree. Now this plant, like I said, is... Uh, native to Guatemala, and it also grows in, uh, uh, like I said, Guerrero, Oaxaca, and Chiapas, uh, down there in southern Mexico. It's a wonderful goddamn tree. Needs to be planted out more. Let's examine the floral structure, huh? Ah, oh, yeah. Okay, so again, you got a flower composed solely of sepals. This is just one massive calyx. The sepals are keeled at the bottom. They got a nice uh, cup down there, and that's so they can, can uh, contain some nectar. You can see it dribbling out right there. Now the Androgynophore, the Androgynophore, that's where the magic happens. Look at those massive uh, anthers, those yellow anthers, each one having a ton of pollen on them, looking like a little hand. Now you could, uh, let's see if we can, yeah, you can see I got the pollen on my hand right now. And uh, I'll take it to another flower, because flowers don't like to, uh, you know, unlike uh, most of you, they don't like to go fuck themselves. Let's see if we can get another one without breaking my ass over there. Oh, 
Okay, there we go. So we'll take it to this guy and I'll put that pollen right on that female part. And I've uh, effectively, and that little stigma right there, see it's on, a, it's, it's on the opposite side of the androgynophore from the anthers. And I've just effectively pollinated that flower. So give it a few months and you'll get a nice fruit on there. Now normally birds do it and you can see how easy a bird does. It sticks his little head down there, sticks his little birdie head down there to get some of the nectar, gets his uh, top of his head dusted with pollen, goes to another flower. And, uh, you know, the same thing, drinking out of it, and like I said, a mockingbird does, but, you know, any bird will really do that, and as well as bats. It gets just, gets pollen all over that goddamn stuff. Look at this. Messy. It's just, it's a fucking, this is a obscenity right there. Boom, you just pollinated that flower. There you go. Oh. Oh, yeah. Oh, this, oh, this nice. Now, one last thing I see fit to mention, I don't normally talk about this, you know, from an ethnobotanical standpoint, because plants are cool for a number of reasons, especially ecology and evolutionary histories, not just because of what they can do for you. You know, it just seems like kind of a simplistic way to look at anything. What can it do for me? The only, the only interest you have in something is whether it serves your silly ass or not, it serves a purpose to you, which is kind of a depauper way to view anything. But uh, I would like to mention, and this is pretty important, that the, tra the traditional medicine in the region where this grows, uh, they've been using this as an anti-diarrheal and anti-secretory uh, for, uh, for centuries. You know, so you get a giardia, you're pissing out your ass, you get a goddamn amoeba or something, and they make flowers, or they make tea out of the flowers here, and uh, supposedly it helps you get a more solid stool. Are you eating right now? I hope so. Maybe I just made you a little nauseous. Anyway, you get a more solid stool and it'll settle your stomach. And uh, there, you go online to like Google Scholar or something, there's a number of research papers uh, denoting the pharmacological effects of many of the compounds, mostly phenols, uh, flavonoids, just phenols, in, uh, in these flowers. Okay? Remember, plants are they're essentially chemical factories. Okay? And there's a lot of wonderful, uh, a lot of wonderful compounds that they contain so uh anyway all right let's keep moving along okay so you know i found a random yard in the neighborhood and this nice lady let me come in here and uh, and film she got a she got a specimen of formonodendron californicum it's getting shaded out by this atlantis altissima okay which is at the uh, tree of heaven they call it it's the one that grows out of fucking roofs and buildings and shit on the east coast but it uh, doesn't do well here unless it's uh in so you know like a irrigated setting such as a residence anyway they decide she probably cut that down because these need full sun but they decide i want to show you the morphology of this flower and this flower unlike caranthodendron this uh, this guy is a lot more drought tolerant okay caranthodendron can't go that long without the moisture okay this guy's more drought tolerant but he also needs full sun and he, he rots easier Okay, like many plants that are drought tolerant, they tend to rot a lot easier and be a lot more intolerant of, uh, you know, excess water. So these can be hard to grow, and I've only grown one or two of these before, and, uh, you know, they grew real fast, got big, put them in full sun, and then a couple years later, uh, you know, the spot they were got shaded out and they just died. But uh, re regardless, you go to, like, the southern Sierra Nevada in Kern County, these are just huge bushes that it's just lighting up, lighting up the goddamn hillside. Now they call this flannel bush, you can see why, it's, again, it's because of those stellate hairs and the texture of those goddamn leaves, okay? Flannel bush, you got a couple different varieties of it. You also got Formantodendron mexicanum, which uh, grows in uh, southern San Diego County, as well as in northern Baja, California. Uh, Alan Rockefeller and uh, my friend Susie and I actually walked up on a massive uh, grow operation in a beautiful spot in a secluded uh, refugial canyon you know the rest of the area was desert but this little canyon it remained cool and moist and uh, you got many uh, many of the plants that uh, otherwise wouldn't be growing here we walked up on a massive grow operation uh, and there were just tons of the uh, Formantodendron mexicanum one of the three species of Formantodendron growing there uh, it was a wonderful spot I'm really happy I knew how to say we are biologists in Spanish otherwise uh, they maybe would have cut our heads off but as it was they just escorted us out and uh, you know, glared at us the whole time, and uh, ended, up, ended up being fine. But it was, you know, I'm not gonna lie, it was mildly terrifying. Anyway, uh, this plant, as you can see, it uh, like like the Caranthodendron, uh, flowers are mostly composed of sepals. I mean, they are just sepals. There's no petals. Okay, but I still got those little keeled cups at the bottom of it, and you still got that androgynophore. But instead of uh, those uh, stamens being uh, fused together in a hand-like structure. 
they just uh, you know completely uh, uh, surround that central style just encircle that central style oops I just broke the goddamn flower off let's look at this one but uh, either way this is the plant that Caranthodendron hybridizes with to produce the intergeneric hybrid which does excellent in cultivation but it has supposedly only been successfully hybridized once now species in different genera are not supposed to be able to hybridize this is an exception meaning that they must be closely related they must share a common ancestor going I don't know a million two million years back maybe a little bit more recent who knows uh, but uh, that lends to, that brings to mind all courts all sorts of uh, biogeographical questions you know considering distributions current distribution patterns of both taxa but that aside let's just shut up and I'll go show you the uh, the wonderful intergeneric hybrid that these two plants create Caranthodendron and Fermatodendron Carantha Fermatia lensia let's go okay I want to show you this hybrid but I'm getting sidetracked by this beautiful uh, Romnea colteri aka the Madalia poppy grows in Southern California goes to Northern Baja too spreads by rhizomes gets fucking massive I was gifted a little four inch pot of this once and uh, you know it just within within a, a couple of years it's spread like eight feet long they get fucking massive scrambled egg flowers look at that beautiful plant uh, you know and uh, again I'm just uh, you know bothering this poor lady by filming this in her yard but uh, wonderful plant okay and this does good I wish they planted this shit along the freeways more than that goddamn oleander what a miserable plant that is huh okay now here's this plant now this is actually a plant I planted you can see it's destroying a fence that's nice I stuck this in the ground I don't know must have been seven years ago six years ago oh look at it look at a sap it's bleeding out and uh you know I just asked the guy can I throw this in your yard and he didn't seem to give a shit so I did it and now it's massive and it's just threatening to destroy the fence anyway let's look at the flower morphology let's let's take a look at what it looks like when you get caranthodendron and fermanodendron together in a room oh yeah okay so you can see the androgynophore uh, apparently the genes for that were inherited from uh, the caranthodendron parent because instead of those stamens encircling that style you still got the general hand structure flowers are a little bit more reduced and the anthers are smaller but uh, you still got those cups which means the birds come in there and it gives it you know it's a wonderful nectar and food source for the birds now uh, somebody I know did say that the caranthodendron flowers they don't smell too good they don't smell too bad but they don't really smell good they smell kind of like a, a sugary cardboard mixed with fajita sauce if you can imagine what that smells like but uh, anyway these are caranto formaggio flowers and uh, they don't really smell like anything but again they do fill with nectar and uh, you know the, the sugar content of the liquid that pulls up in there doesn't seem to be especially uh, you know ripe or sugary it's just more just a, a liquid source a, car a mild carb source for the birds like the mockingbird has been terrorizing me every morning I, I love that fucker though don't get me wrong let's look at the leaves up here again like many members of the Malvasia you got that maple leaf shape okay three lobes okay the lobes are not as shallow as on a caranthodendron paint okay they're they're more like the fromancia still got that glabrous uh, top and then you got the fuzzy abaxial surface right there with those prominent veins wonderful goddamn tree this thing they grow fast they grow fast okay I planted a fucking cypress there too but apparently it got bought by some uh, some uh, rich people who didn't want it wanted it I don't know whatever anyway I mean, who gives a fuck they can do whatever they want with their house I just you know it was a nice tree but thank God they didn't plant like a fucking some oleander or something there anyway so there's a there you go it's about six or seven years of growth they grow really fast if you do and these are frost tolerant you could grow these in a lot of areas you grow these up in the Pacific Northwest you could grow them uh, you know, way down Southern California, they're frost tolerant, like from Monodendron. Caranthodendron is the one that's not frost tolerant. Okay, but these get big as fuck. You don't want to plant these anywhere where you don't got the space for it. I actually had to just take a bunch of branches off of mine, and I'm probably gonna have to remove it soon. And you can see they don't they don't get so much of a straight growth. That one does, but they're just you know, they're a great fucking tree. If you plant them, you do gotta manage them a little bit. You gotta get you know, you gotta prune those uh, those uh, branches that grow laterally. The plagiotrophic growth. Okay. And again, these are these are almost entirely propagated by cuttings. I think the, the hybrid has only been uh, produced via seed once, and it's the same clone everywhere. You could probably do it again. And I guess the guy who did it, he did it. He was at a Rancho Santa Ana Botanic Garden. He's like 94 now. Uh, he uh, 
He's somewhat of a reckless driver, I hear. He's a reckless driver myself. I sympathize with him. And he, uh, he was obsessed with this. He, he just, even back at the time, before the advent of molecular phylogenetics, okay, looking at the DNA barcode, he knew that though these two, uh, Carantodendron and Formanodendron are different, he knew that you could, you could possibly produce a viable hybrid between the two. And so he did it and he tried. He tried for a couple of years and he finally did it and it worked and boom, now we have this wonderful fucking tree. There you go. Full sun grows real fast. Wonderful nectar source for the birds and pollinators and what this shit. Here we go. Anyway, that's all I got for you tonight. Uh, why don't you have a nice day, a uh, nice afternoon. Eat some lunch. Take care of yourself. Wash your hands. Wash your hands. Go fuck yourself. Bye.